Okay, Councilman Machine. All right, so at this point, we're moving on to the portion of the open session called the Council Initiated Discussion. And I think um, all but the new members have seen this before. This is where we sort of turn the control of the microphones over to you. We're happy to hear um, suggestions for uh, future reports or uh, if there are trends out there that you want to draw to our attention or questions that you want to ask the staff. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that came up today and then it came up again in, in your report, Eric, was this issue of how to maintain critical databases that are available for everybody. So I'm wondering, um, Will you be commenting on that again at uh, future council meetings? Is this, could you tell us a little bit more about what, is, is there a formal process or is it just a kind of a over the couple of cu cups of coffee discussion or what is it? So it's probably something in between and anybody on, on staff who have yes. anything to contribute, please walk up to a microphone. But there are, um, I, I really feel um, uh, extensive amount of, of stress about this in part because it's not just me, it's not just NHGRI, but there's a limit to what I can do to change this. Um, so there are several moving parts. Um, my understanding, by the way, is, um, well, immediately I can tell you that uh, John Lorch as NIGMS director and myself and Phil Bourne as the new associate director for data science are all very interested in this and we're interacting regularly to try to discuss how to sort of navigate this because we want to bring this to the attention of um, all the NIH leadership. Francis Collins is aware of it, but we actually think we need to put this out to um, a larger discussion of the institute and center directors, grantees of which are greatly affected by some of the things even two institutes might do, for example. Um, I also know there is an inventory being developed of similar resources supported by other institutes because we're just going to get a, we know what we have at our institute, they know what's at GMS. Um, there, there certainly is interest there. Um, to get find out what else there is. My understanding, and that's why I'm looking if anybody can confirm it, my understanding is that there is BD2K, the Big Data to Knowledge BD2K program is planning a workshop, and there's someone coming to a microphone, maybe a little, my understanding is that there will be a workshop um, in the near future, I don't know when, um, but that's coming. Um, and finally, the last thing I'd say um, is that um, uh, Phil and uh, John and I are regularly interacting and are trying to get this teed up to present probably in the next month or two to the institute and center directors to really raise this, put, put up the flag and say this is really a problem um, at the corporate level and we need help in sort of thinking through it. So, so you just gave me an assignment, which I think, whether you meant to or not, is that I should make sure to come back and update you. I mean, I, I can't, this is not on a strict timetable that I know this, that. But I, I, I think I would naturally be updating council about this, but I will write it down as something that I will definitively try to bring back to you as, as things percolate along. Um, Tina? Maybe, Carol, can you loan a mic? Absolutely. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that we're really working at two different levels. One is within NHGRI, we're working with the large database resources. We're arranging a meeting of the large database resources to really analyze um, how these database resources work, uh, the efficiency, uh, what type of activities they are, are they relevant to NGRI research or not, or maybe they're applicable across different institutes. So we're, right now we're collecting information, um, and, and that will help us decide what to do next and also have these discussions, have more informed discussions about next steps. The other thing we're doing is also uh, to work at, uh, at the NIH level with the BD2K office. And um, basically, uh, uh, there, are, there is a working group, it's called the Sustainability Working Group, that has a number of initiatives that we're evaluating. One is the workshop, and actually the workshop has been put on hold because we have been collecting, there are already reports that can help us to make some decisions about things to test out for the future. Um, so, uh, and there is an RFI that is going to be out pretty soon, and really it, it is to inquire with the community about potential alternative funding models for the database resources. Um, we're talking about supplement projects to really encourage the large databases to, um, to do some projects to improve interoperability of the resources. So there, is, there are different type of activities, many of which are exploratory at this point. 
Um, and so eventually, long term, we're probably what is going to be done is what, what we're doing within NHGRI and what is going on in BD2K will converge and will inform all future discussions. That's a helpful way to frame it. I like that. And, and the way I was trying to frame it, but now I can probably say it even better, is that I think we do need to, I think it's operating at two different levels. I mean, we are internally looking grant by grant, having discussions with the grantees, sort of saying this is, you know, what's our conclusion? This is not sustainable. We need a different model. And then at a whole different level, I mean, and it is very much the premise in some ways of, of the creation of the Associate Director for Data Science position, Phil Bourne's recruitment, also the premise behind Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, sort of the same thing at a corporate level. This is not sustainable. We have to change the way we do business in biomedical research with respect to how we take care of data, how we fund data resources, how we fund all. And so that's at a whole different sort of philosophical level. Hopefully these things will converge, but we, we are doing it in both ways. And several of us are involved in both conversations. But there's so many, there's some immediate issues, but there's also some very clear cultural issues that we need to deal with. Yeah, Bob. One other issue really is um, this trying to strike a balance between the data, the, these things as, as deliverables that we all need and um, uh, emphasizing innovation to improve and make them better. And that the, the, I can see how those are, they're completely bound up together, but in some ways one is much more the mission of the NIH than the other. Yeah. Right. And, and the other thing you just mentioned, and, I, and the other thing about this, of course, which is why it gets to be such a hard problem, and I can tell you that working with John and Phil, we are engaging in conversations outside of NIH, is that it's really not just, I mean, you're going to tackle this problem, it's really not just NIH alone. And it's not even, even the United States, it's not just NIH alone. And then, of course, everything we're dealing with, the way we're all connected, this is a worldwide issue. Um, and it, it's not quite fair that NIH would be carrying as much water as we are in terms of funding all these things when clearly there's an international stage and they all contribute all this data and these resources to everybody. So how we do that, I mean, in some ways this almost becomes a challenge of the international funders. Yeah, Hardy. So um, I, I have now said this to Philip Bourne and Kathy Hudson and I don't know who else, so I'm just going to say to you as well, Please. Um, <laughs> which is that in our report, our I Institute of Medicine report, we say that all of NIH should do exactly what NHGRI has done in mandating data sharing to all its grantees, and that NIH currently has the power to do that. So uh, there's a section of the report that points to the regulation under which NIH has the power. And um, so I, I just wanted to say my piece once again about that. I, and, I, and I completely agree with that. But of course, you do realize that could make the situation worse. Because then if all the data is shared and then the data resources, for example, and it, then all of a sudden we need more servers and we need more curators and more annotators. And so that's where we want to be, which yeah, is no. why this is a not sustainable problem. Because on the one hand, we're asking for more data sharing and the genomic data sharing policy that is going into effect is absolutely what we should be doing, and yet it's going to exacerbate the problem of sustainability. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. And one of the things that the IOM report did not deal, deal well with is the cost problem, and I think that's absolutely right. critical. That said, that's a good problem to have, to have all these people from other institutes actually sharing data. Yep. Carol. Yeah, so I just, you said, Eric, what I was going to bring up, which is that Phil's doing a great job at reaching out outside of NIH to really get the conversation to be much more global because it is not just an NIH problem and the solution could come from another place or one a part of the solution could come from other agencies. And so I think he's, he's doing the right approach to address the sustainability yep. question. I, I will say it's been interesting. Um, in, in the last six months in all the strategic discussions around precision medicine, and I, I'm going to try to avoid saying that every problem we have we lump onto the back of the precision medicine initiative because a lot of people are already doing that. I'm not doing that here. What I am doing is, is illustrating a point, and that is it has been very interesting in the discussions leading up to the announcement that um, the private sector, in particular the, the, the data experts, you know, uh, you know, the Googles and the Silicon Valley types, um, have, have come running, actually, quite interested in the Precision Medicine Initiative because of the data excitement around it. At the same time, that means we've gotten co into conversations with them, and I say we, I mean Phil Bourne, myself, others. Um, and these are, some, these are some folks from, you know, big-name companies that have tackled some major big data issues and solved them. 
and all of a sudden they're getting pretty excited about biomedical big data more broadly, obviously specifically the precision medicine. But so I think the hope, fingers crossed, is that that this will be an exciting enough problem that we, it won't be the usual NIH-funded suspects, um, and that we would bring all new expertise to this. And you know, again, I don't know what this looks like, but it is just exciting to have some people that previously were really interested in you know more corporate-oriented um, IT challenges now putting their their brains into this. And you know, maybe the Precision Medicine Initiative will get them into the problem more focus, and then we'll get them involved in the more general set of sustainability issues. Eric. So on the topic of precision medicine, you know, the President's interest and enthusiasm is greatly appreciated, and my guess is because of that and the fact that he's, he's six years into the term or whatever, things are going to move very quickly in the next six months. And, and I would hope, and NHGRI will also have a major role in that, and I, I would hope that you would come back to Council periodically at a minimum at our next update, but even um, in, in the interim, having specialized phone calls before things are committed to, major things are committed to, w without the addition of new monies. With, with, uh, committed to without the addition of without new monies, Without the yes. addition yeah, yeah. of new monies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about well, how this will all play out and at what time frame and all that. But as I said earlier, I have every intent. I just can't imagine I won't be talking every single council meeting about the initiative, but you are right, maybe some of it will happen so quickly we'll need to engage you between council meetings and, and yeah, you know, that's quite possible. Other topics? Other requests for, so Bob actually raised one issue and I wrote that down, are there other um, topics for future council meetings, things you want updates about? I mean, obviously precision medicine, data sustainability, um, other things that you haven't heard about for a while and you really want an update about, because we always take your advice, it helps formulate the agenda for the open session in particular. And one thing I guess we should mention is there are two workshops that will be in March and there will be reports of those workshops coming to you in May. Okay. All right. Well, you know how to find us and how to reach us. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, let me draw your attention to uh, two quarterly reports, one from the National Society of Genetic Counselors and the other the American Society of Human Genetics. And then we're going to deal with the statement of understanding. And uh, Monica or Cheryl, I don't know if either of you want to move your way to the front of the room in case there are questions. Say again. <laughs> You don't have to come up if you don't want to. The statement of understanding is something that uh, we present to the Council every February. We do it in February because that's when the new members come on board. And uh, at the end of this discussion, I will ask you to um, accept the uh, statement or give us any modifications you think are appropriate. So there will be a vote on it. Um, this document is basically a description of how the Council and NHGRI will interact. It describes the Council responsibilities and it talks about the actions that the Council can take. It also describes the limits of our administrative authorities, which is code speak for the things that we can do without bringing matters to the Council's attention or without seeking uh, a vote from you. Um, it's a four-page document. It's a pretty simple read. I do recommend it uh, for you to look at it. I'm going to very quickly touch on the highlights because I'm not going to ask you to vote on, we're not going to stop and all read this together, and I'm not going to read it out loud, um, but give you a sense of what's in the report, and if you have any questions, we'll attempt to, uh, to answer them. Um, so all applications have to undergo a, uh, a second level of review. Uh, all applications that come in uh, to NHGRI each round, there are some exceptions to those uh, types, and this would include certain types of fellowships, contracts and interagency agreements. The Council doesn't see those. Um, if we don't list an application on the closed session agenda, it means it's being uh, included in the on-block uh, uh, vote, which is taken at the end of the closed session. 
there are certain kinds of applications that we're required to bring to your, to your attention. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to discuss them at depth, but we're talking about large program project grants, uh, T32 institutional training grants, uh, cooperative agreements. So you'll see things listed on the closed session agenda that we don't talk about. That's why they're there. Um, also, um, anything that comes from a foreign institution we're required to bring to your attention and special counsel review, and we'll have a couple of examples of those tomorrow. There are four actions that the council can take on uh, when it comes time to reviewing applications. You can concur with the IRG, the initial review. You can defer the application for re-review because it has come to the council's attention um, as a rebuttal or a, a, a claim on the part of an applicant that there was a, a flaw in, in their initial review. You can recommend the application for high program priority or low program priority, which is another way of saying uh, voting out of uh, score order. Or you can defer the application because you need additional information, you're requesting additional information before you're going to make a determination about it. Um, NHGRI does have uh, certain administrative responsibilities or, or um, uh, capabilities. Um, we do something each round called expedited council concurrence. Uh, there are three council members, I think it's Bob and Jim and Tony, uh, who serve as the ECC reps. So about four or five weeks before the council meeting, they'll get a list of applications. These are largely, not exclusively, SBIR, STTR type applications, and they give us approval to take early action on them. It just allows us to speed up the uh, award mechanism. Uh, the award process, rather. Um, you get a report in every council meeting. It's in the ECB of the applications that have been approved uh, for this round of ECC, and you can see the ones that were awards were made from the, the previous council round. So the information is there. We're not trying to hide it from you. We're just trying to expedite them. Staff authorities. Um, the staff has the authority to make uh, administrative supplements on any existing grant up to $150,000 uh, or 25% of the total cost of the um, application. Um, now, we've set a cap on that of $1 million because 25% of a multi-million dollar grant would be a huge sum of money. Um, Again, you'll get a report uh, each council round of the administrative awards that uh, have been made by, by staff. Um, and then there's actually a clause in there that says in, in the event of a uh, catastrophe, uh, act of nature or pandemic flu, that the council can meet by electronic means, so teleconference and a secure website, et cetera. So that, in a nutshell, is a summary of um, what's in the uh, uh, statement of understanding. Are there any questions? No debate. Nothing you saw that's inflammatory there. Good. Um, there haven't been any substantive changes to the statement of understanding from what the veterans saw last year. So can I have a motion to accept the statement? And a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. All right. So our last action uh, before we uh, close the open session and go into closed section, session is for me to read the statement of conflict of interest. And this applies to the applications that you're going to review in the closed session. You must leave the meeting room when applications submitted by your own organization are being individually discussed. In the case of state higher education or other systems with multiple campuses geographically separated, own organization is intended to mean the entire system, except where a determination has been made that the components are separate organization for the purpose of conflict of interest. You should avoid situations that could give rise to charges of conflict of interest, whether real or apparent. For example, you should not participate in the deliberations and actions on any application from or involving your spouse, your child, a recent student, a recent teacher, a professional collaborator with whom you have worked closely, a close personal friend, or a scientist with whom you have had long-standing scientific or personal differences. 
The NHGRI staff will determine the appropriate action based on recency, frequency, and strength of such associations or interest, either positive or negative, and will instruct you accordingly. In council actions in which your vote on a block of applications without discussing any individual application, the so-called on-block action, your vote will not apply to any application from an institution fulfilling the criteria noted above. Now, in your folders or at the table, there should have been a conflict of interest form. Uh, please sign it, and we'll collect them uh, at the end of the day today. Okay? So you want to gavel us is done? Okay. We are, we are finished. Well.